Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Suzanne Miller, and I'm a principal investigator in the SEI Software Solutions Division. Today, I am joined by my friend and colleague, Rick Kasman, a visiting scientist in the SEI Software Solutions Division. We're here today to discuss two software architecture patterns for the category of deployability, and we'll explain what that is. These patterns were recently explored in the fourth edition of Software Architecture and Practice, which Rick co-authored with Len Bass and Paul Clements. Welcome, Rick. It's good to talk to you again. Good to see you again, Susie. So let's start by having you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, why you came to the SEI and the work that you do here. And in particular, your uh, visiting scientist is a little different role. So maybe explain a little bit about that and what other things you do besides work with us. Sure, so uh, I'm a a professor at the University of Hawaii. I've been um, at the, with the SEI and wearing various hats for over 20 years now. uh, originally as a, a member of the technical staff, and then since 2000 as a visiting scientist, where I've been involved in a whole bunch of different projects, um, uh, worked on a bunch of books in the SEI series with various co-authors, uh, and uh, uh, most of my work centers around architecture analysis, architecture, um, design, requirements gathering, and tooling for all of the above, and empirical studies on all of the above. So I think I mentioned this in the last podcast, but uh, most of our books have the word practice somewhere in the title. Mm -hmm. And we take that really seriously, that we don't want to be preaching anything in our books, in our blog posts, in our podcasts, that we have not road tested in practice, that we have not worked with real practicing architects on real world systems. And so uh, I feel comfortable that when I, when I preach something, I've got you know some reasonable empirical yeah. foundation behind it. Yep. No, and that is one of the things that I think people appreciate about the work of the SEI in general is that to the extent possible, we want to prove things in practice, at least in an initial way. I know we can't always do the classic, you know, controlled experiments, but um, which is why it's in practice and not in the lab. So so um, I think our I think our audience understands that. And if not, sometime we'll have a discussion about the difference between uh, different kinds of empirical studies and classical hypothesis based wouldn't that be fun one of my favorite sayings is in practice there's no difference between in between theory and practice sorry in theory there's no difference between theory and practice in practice there is okay got that (laughs) I like that. Oh, okay, you're making me spin around. All right, so let's move on <laughs> to talking about architecture patterns and deployability. First, how about just explain a little bit about what do we mean when we say an architecture pattern? Because not everybody understands that concept. Sure, so the whole field of patterns has been around for uh, about three decades, depending on who you want to trace it to. But most people would go back at least as far as the 1994 book by the mm-hmm. Gang of Four. Yep. on um, design patterns. And shortly thereafter, people st- starting in around 2000, people started publishing books of architectural patterns. Mm-hmm. And there are many, many of these books of architectural patterns. And a pattern is simply a collection of architectural elements, some kind of components, some kind of connections between them, organized in some sort of topology with some constraints on that organization. So if you think of the layers pattern, the most common pattern ever, Uh, You've got these components that are layers. You've got these connections between them, some sort of calling or allowed to use relationship. And you've got some constraints on topology, like some versions of layering say, you can't have cycles between the layers. If layer one calls layer two, layer two can't call layer one. Or you can't skip a layer. You can't go directly from layer one to layer three. Then typically the way these are documented 
there's a context in which you uh, would apply a particular pattern. There's pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. of the patterns and the trade-offs of the patterns. And together, this represents a package of time-tested design decisions with proven outcomes, things that they're good for, things that they're not so good for, the context in which you should or should not use it. So it's it's this nice prepackaged wisdom yeah. so that you, the architect, don't have to reinvent this wheel that's been reinvented a thousand, a hundred thousand times over for, for decades. Gotcha. And, and this is important. I think um, software engineering is a newer discipline than say civil engineering. And, you know, we, the patterns um, movement I see as an analog to some of the standard practices that you see in guidebooks for, you know, bridge building or things like that, that were built you know, hundreds of years ago, those patterns are, are sometimes hundreds and thousands of years old, but I see it as an evolution of our discipline that we actually are capturing that same kind of wisdom. We don't have to reinvent from theory every single thing because we have this experience base that has been tested in, in contexts that we can be explicit about. And yeah. so that to me is one of the great values of patterns is it's, is it's giving us some of that engineering maturity that has been present in other disciplines for much longer. Yeah, and patterns are not a guarantee of success. A pattern can be undermined by poor realization mm -hmm. or by allowing the pattern to erode uh, through inadequate maintenance. So a, uh, a very large and important bridge near the SEI in Pittsburgh just collapsed <laughs> yep. in March, I think it was. Yes, Fern Hollow Bridge. Yep. <laughs> yep, and that was an example of a a reasonable pattern, a reasonable engineering decision that was undermined by poor maintenance right. over decades. Right. Yep. Right. So yep. It's, no, the pattern point. doesn't guarantee success. It is a precursor to or an enabler of success. Yes. Excellent. Okay. And so let's move. So architecture patterns, what is, what's your definition of deployability? Because before we got on camera, we were talking about different contexts of deployment and it's important for you for people to understand what's the context of deployability um, right, for this right. set of patterns. So I'm going to restrict, we, we were having this discussion before the podcast, mm -hmm. I'm restricting this discussion to deployment of software. Mm -hmm. And here we're talking about deploying of software onto an environment in which that software can be executed. That could be a cloud environment, that could be onto your laptop, that could be onto a peer-to-peer uh, -peer network or a set of edge devices, whatever your platform is for deployment, with predict a predictable and acceptable amount of time, effort, and risk. Okay. Right? So it could be that every time you deploy, you it's handcrafted, you know, and you hand carry your fragile little software component and you lovingly place it in its environment. And while that might work for small and infrequent deployments, low risk deployments, it's probably not a, a, a very strong engineering approach to deployability. So we tend to want to automate uh, and regularize deployability as much as possible so that it is, is predictable, that it is cost controlled, it's efficient, yeah. it's testable and so forth. We, we treat deployment scripts just like any other piece of software, in fact. Right. And, and that's, that's an important point. I think as we get into the to the era of DevSecOps, containerization, et cetera, et cetera, those aspects, deployability, you know, where in the past I might have deployed to a server once a month, I may now be deploying into this or that container environment once a day. And right, right. the effort required once a month might be acceptable to be handcrafted or hand scripted each time, but not when we're doing once a day and the error proneness of those handcrafted scripts versus the regular scripts, uh, you know, becomes an issue. So we, th those two things alone are going to make deployability something that should be considered by people that are using modern environments and modern methods. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about the patterns that, that you found are useful for improving deployability. Okay. Yeah. But before I do that, let me just, okay. let me just add one thing to, to what you just said that we, we talk about um, three aspects of deployability, and these patterns are going to address these three aspects. And okay. one is the granularity. What's the granularity of the thing that you're deploying? Is it a, is a monolith? We've got to deploy the whole thing, all or nothing? <clears throat> 
Can we deploy little bits and pieces of it? We just want to change the authentication part of the system. We just want to change the edge detection algorithm, you know, some little right. tiny piece of the whole. <clears throat> so the granularity of deployment, how controllable that is. So how easy is it to roll things out and roll them back? If we decide that maybe it's, you know, it passed all the tests in the test environment, but it, once we got into production, things have, you know, going off the rails. And how efficient, which gets back to what we were just talking about, uh, what's the level of effort required to do that? And if you're doing, you know, your Netflix and you're rolling out many deployments per day or your Google and you're doing many deployments a day, then you want that to be extremely efficient right. and as automated as possible. So, so keep those three okay. characteristics in mind when we talk about the patterns. All right. So uh, the first one is really... It's not really a deployability pattern, but just a way of thinking about granularity, which is microservice architecture. So the more that you granularize okay. your architecture, the more that you make each service its own little independent thing, managing its own data and talking through some well-defined interfaces or perhaps through a, a, a broker of some sort, the easier it is to deploy that little piece, that granule of the system. So that's orthogonal to what you're actually, how you're actually doing the deployment. I just make, make that as a sort of side comment to say, the more granular your architecture, right. like microservices, the easier it makes some things. It is not a panacea. So there have been, um, many organizations are actually pulling back from microservice architectures these days because they realize that well, we're always deploying microservices one through 73 together. And so why are they even separate microservices? They're paying all the execution overhead and packaging overhead for no gain. Right, right. And in fact, they're giving something up. So just want to say that granularity isn't a more granular is always better. Sure. Kind of but lever that, you could always push. The fact that we are able to measure that right, is important, that, that the granularity and that we're looking at that. I mean, the people that notice that 1 to 73 are all is deployed at the same time, those are people that are actually using the attributes of their architecture to measure its performance. And that's also, um, you know, if you start out one way, it means it doesn't mean you have to stay there, right? Yeah. And that's, that's the there, point there. There was actually an article in IEEE Software a few months ago called The Monolith Strikes Back, which ah. was uh, we can put that in, in the notes of this blog. I can give you yeah. the, the, ref, the, the, the citation for it, but it was exactly on this yeah. uh, topic, how monoliths are actually starting to have a little bit of a renaissance these days as people pull back from their unbridled sure. enthusiasm for microservice architectures. Okay. All right. Okay, let's talk about deployment patterns. So um, one category of deployment patterns is patterns for complete replacement of a services. So I have N services, and I want to replace those uh, with N new versions right. of those services. And so one pattern for that is called uh, blue-green. And the idea of the blue-green pattern is that I would have two deployment environments, two de environments that are as identical to each other as I could possibly make them. And then I deploy, and I have the green, which is the running version, right? Green light means go. And I have the blue, which is where I deploy my new latest, greatest versions of these services. And then what I can do is um, I can um, do a cutover to the blue. I can monitor them. And once it's determined that the new instances are working properly up to spec, then I can remove the, the old versions of the services, or I simply rename blue to green, and I rename green to blue, and, and you know, I start over with the next deployment. And so um, the nice thing about that is that there's ideally just a single switch, right? We point to blue, ooh, things are going off the rails, boop, yep. back okay. to green before too much damage has been done. So this pattern implies a lot of measurement going on Correct. under the covers because it, for me to know that I need to go from blue back to green, I have to know that it's going off the rails and I've got to have baseline measures and I've got to have be able to compare my blue performance to my green baseline. Yep. And so that means you need to think about monitorability 
Ah, another quality attribute. Another yes. quality attribute when you're architecting that system is how am I going to monitor for um, system resources, like how much memory is this using? How close am I to reaching the maximum CPU limit? How much am I you know, uh, using my buffers or my bandwidth or whatever? database accesses, you know, whatever I care about measuring. But you may also have um, application specific measures like uh, how many customers abandoned their shopping cart without checking out, right? And we don't know why. We just yeah. know that when we yeah. switched over to the new version, we're getting a lot more, you know, a lot higher bounce rate. Right, right, right. Than we did before. So it could be, as I say, these system specific measures or they could be application specific measures. Okay. All right. So that uh, pattern, what are the, what's the downside to that pattern? So every, every pattern's got sort of a context it works well in. What, yeah, where would you absolutely. not want to use a blue green pattern? Absolutely. So of course it's expensive to maintain two identical versions of your environment, especially if your environment is, um, is big and costly. And, um, this might, in fact, siphon resources away from your testing infrastructure, ah. right? If you only have so many machines, sure. so many instances, yeah. uh, you may be making a trade off there between how much infrastructure I can put in my blue green versus how much I have in my test environment. And it means that you really have to pay careful attention to these environments to ensure that they are, in fact, truly right. identical or as identical as you can make them. And that's trivial in some environments but almost impossible in other environments where they have really extensive and messy uh, deployment infrastructures. Okay. When I say messy, it, like you have connections to 130 different partners. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. So how do you manage all those 130 connections in both environments? And, and identical connections in both environments. Right. And you've got to so, get your partners to agree to having two connections you know, always in play and things like that. So there's, yeah. there's business aspects to this that could come so, into play. So we worked years ago with a, a energy broker that was operating in the Midwest and they had all these connections to all these different utilities, power companies. Sure. And they just said, we cannot, we do not have a test environment that replicates our production environment. Impossible for us. Gotcha. So, you know, in some, in, in, in some domains, easy in some domains, this okay. just may not be possible. Is Am I correct in thinking that this is one of the areas where a cloud environment is advantageous because I do have uh, more elasticity of resources and the yep. ability to containerize and, and, you know, make things more, have more environment parity among multiple. Yeah. Then it's only about money. Yeah, well, oh, I, ah, <laughs> it's just money. It's Easy. just money, right? Okay, all right. So blue green. Um, I would also expect, but, but, but I want to hit risk just a minute because you talked about a little bit about business risk. But is this a deployment pattern that I would need to be careful about if I was in a, like, say, in a healthcare environment where I was in a high risk if this fails? That yeah, blue absolutely. Green may so be there's a little not my, my choice. There's a number of patterns that then can bring that risk down. So one is called rolling upgrade. Okay. And that's the idea that rather than um, uh, replacing all instances of your service or services at once, you replace some, some slice. Okay. And you may um, choose like to replace only one instance at a time, or you may choose a few instances, but in each case, it would typically, typically be a small fraction of the instances that you would replace at any one time. Okay. And it's rolling. And so you are rolling out service after service after service until at some point all versions of the old service have, have been replaced. Okay. And again, you need to um, you need to monitor those to ensure that the uh, the new instances are behaving as sure as expected, but that does lower the risk. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Cause I know there's people out there that think ah, I couldn't possibly think about this. Um, all right. So second pattern. Okay. So kind of building on this idea of rolling upgrade, but taking a different dimension is what's called canary testing. And the idea there is, you know, the, the, the canary in the coal mine is right. the metaphor that this is, is borrowing from is, um, 
your canary in this case is going to be some subset of your target market. Maybe you're going to roll it out to just your internal users first, or you have a dedicated group of beta, beta testers or something like this. And so they're your canaries. And if they go, then you know that, you know, this was a right. bad uh, rollout and, and you haven't affected any of your actual real high value Larger, production yeah. users, let's say. And so, um, uh, these could be, um, um, as I say, purely low risk users, like internal users, but you might also, um, cultivate groups of users who exercise different paths, different kinds wow, of functionality in different ways. Okay. So you can be quite strategic about this, um, before you decide to go live with the release and the canary testing can work in conjunction with the blue green or the, um, the, the, rolling. the rolling upgrade. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so again, when would I not want to use canary testing or canary deployment? Well, certainly all of the trade-offs in the blue green uh, pattern apply here, okay. right? You're still going to have to have identical or as near as possible identical infrastructures. Um, but now you're going to have additional complexity for managing configurations, right? Okay. Who gets routed to which version gotcha. of what service at what time? And then maybe they have to be rolled back. And so all of that really needs to be carefully orchestrated. Um, if not, then you might you might miss important signals right. about what has gone right or what has gone wrong. And it sounds like in this pattern, I actually have to do more of a, I would call it an experimental design in terms of what parameters are is each canary population seeing? Right. And does that give me, you know, does this group give me enough confidence that I'm going to go with a higher, higher volume rollout or do I need to have rolling yeah. canaries? <laughs> Right, exactly. So, okay, so maybe group I have a group okay, of, but now I can go to this larger group. I have a group of power users that exercise some rarely used paths in the system, or I have another group yeah. that's really going to hammer on the database because they're they're loading and retrieving huge image files, or right. or you know whatever it, it makes sense for your domain. You might um, have different kinds of canaries for different system conditions that you want to probe. Yep, yep, yep. Nope, I get it, and. Um, uh, I, I'm a canary on a, for a couple of sort of odd pieces of software that I like because I want to, because yeah, I have specific aspects of the software that I care about and I don't want them to screw those up. So, you know, I volunteer anytime they ask for somebody <laughs> yeah. to do that. So, yeah. so yeah. So, so I, and it sounds like the canary deployment pattern is, am I correct that it's probably one that's for user centered uh, user facing kinds of things, or do, do you, do you well, use a canary pattern when it's more machine to machine? Yeah. So, um, in fact, when it's more user, user functionality, that's a special variant of this pattern that's called AB testing. Right. Okay. Yep. So canary testing is often about the functionality of the system. AB testing may, you may be, um, marketers are really keen on using sure. AB testing because they want to test sometimes tiny differences in the user experience or the user interface. They're really so, about prefer human preferences. Yeah. So the, the uh, anecdote, I don't know if it's true, but they said that Google did A-B testing on 41 different shades of blue wow. on its search results before they arrived at the one that they, that they finally settled on, right? And you think like, ah, blue, pick one. But nope. They, uh, okay. they did the systematic testing. And, and so um, things like, what color do I make the, the proceed and the cancel button? Yeah. You know, yeah. Or, or things like that, that you don't even think about. Somebody has to make those design sure. decisions and they'll often use A-B testing with a set of um, uh, hand-picked users or sure. just with a very tiny subset of the users, real users. Yeah. To yeah, well, and I can see like that particular one using, you know, there's a lot of variations in colorblindness 
Um, I have, I have a friend who, you know, for example, everything looks to him from some gradation of pink to brown. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a very unusual one, but it, but it's out there. And so, you know, when I would, when I would do slides and when he was, you know, when he worked with us, you know, I would always send them to him and say, is there anything that looks totally weird here? Because I can't see that spectrum the way he does, but I could do tonal differences or things like that that would make it more readable for him. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's, so there's things like that, that if you don't have an awareness of some of the variance in human perception, um, you're just not going to hit it. And so, yeah, I can see, I can, I, I get the 41 shades of blue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so th those are kind of the major patterns that I wanted to talk about okay. today, but I think that the, the point of the blog post and the point of um, the, the, the tactics, the patterns and the tactics that we've provided is to raise awareness of this as, a, as an area of software engineering, of software architecture that people need to and people are increasingly uh, becoming aware of and, and paying attention to because you know, more and more so of our software is being deployed into complex environments. Yeah. You know, onto cloud environments, onto edge environments, onto microservices, sure. onto IoT. Uh, and so deployment is, well, as I said, you, you have to treat your deployment scripts as software. Right. They should be and, and it can't be an afterthought. I think the real yeah. message is this cannot be an afterthought or else it's going to be problematic. And yeah. a good piece of software may never get to its intended use because it's not deployable on a regular basis. Yeah, and or if you not mess up and you deploy the wrong version and and there's a security hole or there's a performance risk or yeah. you you start crashing left and right. And you can't bring it back. You know, if you, right, uh, if, if, if rolling yeah. back to the old version is, is costly or, or risky or damaging to your reputation, right, these things can have huge consequences. Yep. So, um, yeah, that was kind of why we, we wrote the, the technical report where these patterns were, are included, the blog post, and, and again, uh, wrote about it in the book. Right. Why, that's why they made it into the book. Only the, only the really good patterns make it into the book, right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it. The rest were left on the cutting room floor. There you go. There you go. Um, Rick, as always, it's a pleasure to talk with you and to explore some of these ideas that, that we may take for granted or else we may not be thinking about and we should. And so I hope our audience appreciates that as much as I do. Um, we did mention several things during the uh, talk and we will make sure that those links are included in the transcript. Um, and I do want to remind our audience that this podcast will be available wherever you get your podcasts. Um, our favorite is the SEI YouTube channel. But, um, you know, you can get it wherever you like. And I do want to thank all of you for joining us today and go forth and make deployable software. All right. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Susie. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.